Okay, just a moment. Just a moment. Okay, so we are recording. So again, it's a pleasure to welcome Steve Kleiman from MIT. And uh, he's gonna talk on uh, the geometry of Bonistein Artinian algebras. So please, Steve. Okay, well, thank you, Eduardo. And thanks to all the uh, organizers for giving me this opportunity to talk about my work with uh, Jan. Some of you may have heard we talk about uh, the work before. Since then, we've made a lot of progress and my talk today will focus on uh, this progress, uh, particularly on the geometry. Uh, of course, I have to review a little bit from before, so we'll all have a, a good base on which to build the geometry. Now, let me um, explain a little bit about the uh, quote uh, from Muir on, on the right top. So the quote is in print, but um, Muir told me a little, little bit about it. It seems Grothendieck went to the Netherlands in the early 19... Uh, is there an echo there? Steve, you're you're muted right now. Oh, sorry, sorry, I, I I was mute myself. I'm sorry, <laughs> Steve. Could you unmute yourself? There should be a link in the bottom if you just move your mouse. Okay. Uh, just a moment, Steve, I'll see if I can fix this here. Just, I'm sorry, Steve. Let's see if that works here. Uh, Ethan, can you unmute yourself? No? Okay, okay. Okay, sorry. Let's see if I can. Would you unmute now? No. no. Okay, okay. How about you, Steve? Uh, am I? Um... Yes, now you're talking. I, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I guess it's my first. Okay, okay. Now it's work. <laughs> okay, so let me uh, thank Eduardo for the introduction and the rest of the organizers for inviting me to speak today about my work with Jan. Uh, some of you have heard me talk about some of this work before. And uh, since then, 
Jan and I have made a lot of progress. And of course, I'm going to focus on that progress. I'll have to review a little bit of uh, the preliminaries that I, I spoke about before, before but not, not that much. So now I'd like to um, explain the background of the quote I have from uh, Jakob Mora up in the corner. So this quote is in print, but um, Muir explained to me that Grothendy came to the Netherlands and spoke about his work on uh, his theory of the Picard scheme in the early 1960s and explained that uh, he felt that the, the people in, in Bay school made too strict assumptions and tried to prove too little. So uh, let me read a sentence from Bay's um, collected works, his commentaries at the end. Ever since 1949, I considered the construction of an algebraic theory of the Picard variety as the task of greatest urgency in abstract algebraic geometry. Well, they had trouble. They worked only over a field and they didn't have a good theory of families of Picard varieties, following families of varieties. And of course, they didn't have the richer structure of, of schemes with nilpotents. So Grothendieck provided these and he had to develop the tools to do so, notably the theory of representable functors. So there's some parallel here between um, that situation and, and Jan's work and, and mine. Uh, a lot of people have been working on the uh, geometry of families of, of art and rings, but uh, the work has, has handled mostly special cases. There isn't really a general theory which uh, we want to provide. If there's anybody who's uh, equivalent to they in that quote, it, it would be um, Tony Yarabino, whose uh, work has been fundamental in this subject. And he's proved a lot of uh, results himself and inspired a lot of others and worked with many people and uh, now serves as well as a clearinghouse. If you want to know what's been proved in the subject, you, you ask Tony and he'll tell you. So, okay, let's get started with the talk itself. Um, so our basic question is, uh, is the Hilbert scheme irreducible? The Hilbert scheme of points. So D here is just an integer, not not a function, not a Hilbert polynomial. We could rephrase this in, as follows. Well, you see, we have a certain subset of uh, the Hilbert scheme that per parameterizing disjoint points. And so we could ask whether the closure of this set is, is the whole Hilbert scheme or a weaker form whether the dimension of the Hilbert scheme is bigger than the dimension of this set sigma. Or we could put it yet another way is every Artinian quotient of the polynomial ring smoothly. Do we have a flat family that deforms the given Artinian quotient into a, a disjoint well? the algebra of the disjoint union. The answer to this question, in fact, the question itself was considered by um, Yarbino and Emsalem in 78. And notably they proved that for R at least eight and D equals uh, two R plus two, 
most they are not smoothable. In fact, they found a, a component of bigger dimension. So if we let gamma denote the local Gorenstein algebras, not necessarily concentrated at the origin, but ones that have Hilbert function one RR1, um, then the dimension of this locus is uh, given there, r times r plus one times r plus five over six minus one. And uh, you can compute easily that its dimension is, it, uh, is greater than r times c, the dimension of sigma, when r is at least eight. So our goal today is to give a proper justification of this um, result about gamma. How do we study gamma? And, and then to do so in its natural generality. Jan and I have studied much more general loci, but this case will give the spirit of, of the work and it's technically less complicated. So it's, it's a better one to lecture on. I'll talk a little at the very end about our more general analysis. So um, in passing, we might consider what happens when R is less than or equal to seven, natural uh, to, to wonder about it. When R is equal to seven, then the Hilbert scheme is reducible, but, but gamma, this locus is uh, irreducible and contained in the closure. So this was proved well, in 2018, the paper appeared in the archive, but um, it's still not in print. What's curious is that um, the case R equals six was discussed by Yarbino and Kanev in the lecture note series quite some time ago, but their work didn't cover the case seven. So it was curious uh, to know what happened in that case. A lot of other people have worked on the problem and found that when R is less than or equal to five, then in fact, the Gorenstein locus, a larger locus, um, these algebras we're looking at are Gorenstein. In fact, they're compressed in the sense that their Sockel degree, which is three, the largest non-zero value, uh, is minimal for the length d that we're considering. So the algebra sits on a small bottom of Sockel. Um, R equals five was proved, uh, well, first of all, the case of hand in 2014, but then uh, the full Gorenstein locus was, was carried, uh, was discussed in, the next year. Uh, R equals four in, in 2011. R equals three by a very different kind of method, not one using um, Macaulay duality by uh, Hans Klepper, a different Klepper um, in uh, 78 using the Eisenberg and Buxbaum resolution. And of course, there's the famous work of John Fogarty um, proving that the Hilbert scheme of the plane is irreducible and smooth. And uh, Grothendieck himself, in his Bourbaki talk, where he constructed the Hilbert scheme, considered the case one and, and proved that. Uh, the Hilbert scheme is the symmetric product, 
the affine space of larger dimension of dimension i. Uh, sorry, um, depends on the product, yeah. So ours and our, the Hilbert scheme of the line um, is, is the symmetric product. Okay, so what about R equals greater than or equal to four? So here the subject is studied by looking at the geometry of the Macaulay dual delta of gamma. And the problem is to see that these two algebraic loci are in fact schemes, are isomorphic as schemes. And what's in it, published now is a little, uh, well, vague or in some places and incomplete. Uh, there's work with the reduction instead of with the locus itself, even though you want to compute tangent spaces from the equations or deformation theory. So, okay, um, how can we handle the isomorphism? Well, we do so using Macaulay duality. Macaulay introduced duality in 1994. Sorry, it was reprinted in 94. It was introduced in the original mon monograph was in 1916, but there was so much interest that it was reprinted. And there's a huge literature, not just on the duality itself, but on, on its applications. But to do a theory of uh, families, we need a more general base. Wait. So let's take an arbitrary Noetherian base K and look at the polynomial ring and our variables over K. And then um, the duality takes place in the graded dual. So Macaulay took the uh, K span of all the reciprocals. This is an algebra, of course, but we don't care about the algebra structure. Just the red herring for us. Uh, notice that if we look at all the monomials and all the reciprocals of the monomials, we get a dual basis under the pairing of multiplication and take the term of degree zero. So this R dagger is an R module via the adjoint action. Whenever you have a pairing and an, if you um, have an operator on one side, you get an adjoint operator in the other. So we take the adjoint of multiplication and we get a module structure. If you work that out in the case at hand, then a monomial L times a reciprocal monomial one over M is most often zero, but uh, if L divides M, then it's L over M. Okay, a few more generalities. Let's uh, let Gothic M uh, denote the ideal of the variables and say that a M filtered R module C is K Artinian with Hilbert function HC. If either C is a graded module and the nth term is locally free of rank N, of course, most of them are zero. Or the associated graded module is K Artinian with Hilbert function HC. But of course, we want uh, a finite filtration. So um, we assume it's zero on the one side for 
large N and um, C on the other side. It's important that the modules be locally free. One thing that Grothendieck taught us is that flatness is what formally in, uh, incorporates the idea of, of an algebraic family. So as often is done, let's let C star denote the dual, it's dual over the brown ring K um, into K. And uh, this harm has a, a standard filtration. If we consider uh, K as um, filtered in the usual way, then um, so concentrated in degree zero, then homomorphisms carrying the nth filtered piece into the m plus nth filtered piece for all n will form the nth filtered piece. And you can work that out in the case at hand, it turns out to be um, this expression on the right, c mod f of minus one m and c dual. And then uh, a simple elementary computation shows that if you take the associated graded module of the dual, you get the dual of the associated graded. And the Hilbert function flips because the reciprocal monomials all have negative degree. Okay. Now, the first important theorem is that uh, this functor star is dualizing on the category of K Artinian filtered R modules, which is to say that if you do it twice, you recover where, where you started. And that means that star gives you an anti equivalence of categories the category of uh, k Artinian tilted modules onto itself. Moreover, star restricts to a dualizing functor on the graded modules. And star obviously carries a graded module to itself. And it commutes, star commutes with the retraction so whether you, uh, to the associated graded, so whether you dualize first and then take the associated graded or take the associated graded and then dual, you get the same. That's the content of the lemma. Moreover, and this is particularly important, star commutes with every base change. We want a map of functors, star should, so we, we want to represent functors. So star has to commute with base strings. So the proof is actually quite easy. Um, if you take any locally free uh, module C, then you have well, the natural map and it's an isomorphism because the module is locally free when locally it's trivial. So, so that's good. But also you can check easily that the um, filtration is, is uh, carried to itself when you square the duality. And finally, the base change map is an isomorphism. Again, because C is locally free of finite rank. Now, Macaulay duality itself is a special case where we consider not all K Artinian modules, but just those that are quotients of uh, our ring R, the polynomial ring over K. And uh, a quotient is carried into a submodule, but not 
arbitrary submodules and not simply flat submodules, but those whose quotient our dagger mod D is K flat. That's very important. Another lesson of growth and dictatus is that you should always impose flatness on the quotient, not on the submodule. So uh, also star restricts to a bijection between the graded quotients A and the graded submodules D, obvious. And it respects the passage to the associated gradient. Moreover, and as I say, this is particularly important, star can use the base change. Okay, now here's an example. I don't want to dwell on it, but it's fun to play with these um, inverse monomials. So, Here's a, an example, you take the uh, sum of the third power reciprocals and the submodule they generate. Um, and, and notice that if you take one of the variables Xi and multiply it by Q, then you pick out just one of them because the others are zero and then you lower the degree. So if you work that out, you find that uh, you get uh, this module, this description of the module D, it's KQ and so forth. And this module has uh, the desired Hilbert function. So there are modules with this Hilbert function and that's an important observation. Um, we can, find the equations that define the algebra itself. So the algebra is the dual of D and we can write it of course as a quotient of R. That quotient is called, is the annihilator of D. It's general theory again, it's called the polar module. So we just look at all P such that uh, polynomials P such that P times Q is, is zero. Well, if we work that out, there are only a few terms that could be non-zero, here they are. And so we get zero only when these coefficients are equal to zero. And if you think about it for a minute or two, you'll see that um, I is generated by these particular polynomials, rather simple. But in particular, it's not a complete intersection. And it may be smoothable. So it's not an, an example of the sort we wanted at the beginning, but it is an example of uh, of an algebra with the appropriate Hilbert function. Now, if you're just given the equations, it's not obvious that it's a Gorenstein algebra. So why in the world is it? Well, here's the story. First of all, we have a version of matless duality. Um, if we take a filtered, Artinian algebra A, not necessarily a, a quotient, then in the category of uh, filtered modules, A star is a dualizing module, which is to say that the function of, of homomorphisms over A into A star is a dualizing function. And this is easy to see. Um, it comes down to the adjoint associativity formula, as, as McLean called it, the <clears throat> adjunction between palm and tensor product. And if we just see what that says, it says that the palm into A dual is uh, C dual.
So as a consequence, um, this ring algebra A is Gorenstein if and only if A star is cyclic locally on, on spec K. K is in a field, so we have to work locally. And um, this holds essentially by definition. Well, there are a lot of different definitions equivalent of a Gorenstein ring. Uh, the first in print, according to Hunica, uh, was given by Sear in, in 57. And it is that A is Gorenstein if and only if its dualizing module is invertible. This is a, a good definition for geometries. The dualizing sheet has primary importance for us. Okay, now, uh, so that's why our example before is Gorenstein. We started out with the cyclic module and took it to it. Okay, so here's some more um, notation. Let's let S be the largest integer n such that the Hilbert polynomial h is not zero. This is called the Sockel degree. And of course, well, to begin with, h is just a function from z to z, but we want it to have finite support. And now we want to consider um, algebras that are supported at the origin. So, um, we look at this quotient of R and take the um, subscheme of the full Hilbert scheme of algebras uh, whose spec is contained in this Y. And let's let lambda H denote the locus in H of all the quotients with this given Hilbert function. Now this is a scheme, it has a natural scheme structure. We just have to uh, render flat all the um, appropriate pieces, namely these um, partial, quo these quotients, A mod MQ. And, uh, we can do that using uh, this webinar, lemma in Grothendieck's seminar, uh, where he constructed the Hilbert scheme, namely given any coherent sheaf on a, a local Noetherian scheme and an integer, integer n, there's a map, there's a subscheme z, such that a map into uh, the Hilbert scheme, or the ambient scheme, factors through Z, if and only if the pullback of that is locally free of rank N. So the restriction of F to Z is not only um, locally free of the given rank, but also we've represented the functor of um, of schemes that render F locally free of rank N. So, well, Groth and Dick gave no proof of, of this lemma, but there is a proof in Mumford's book, Curves on Surfaces. But it's really a simple application of fitting ideals, although Mumford didn't call them that. Okay. Now, um, notice that the, uh, the filtration of um, the graded dual, our DAGA, just consists of the uh, inverse 
uh, well, the sums of inverse monomials of degree at least minus s, and take the associated sheaf, which is supported at the origin. And let's let uh, H star denote the sort of the name, well, uh, this function where we change n into minus n. Then um, we have the locus of subsheaves of um, the submodule f minus s of r dagger goes with this Hilbert function. And of course, we have to insist that the quotient be flat so that everything can use the base change. This locus is a subscheme of the quote scheme. And uh, we construct it pretty much in the same way using Grothendieck's lemma. Now, the main theorem is that Macaulay duality provides a canonical isomorphism of schemes between these two loci, the loci of quotients with Hilbert function H and the locus of um, sub uh, of sub modules uh, with Hilbert function H star, whose quotient is flat, locally too. It restricts, so this canonical isomorphism of schemes restricts to the sub loci of closed sub schemes of homogeneous quotients on the one side and of homogeneous submodules on the other side. And it commutes with forming associated graded modules. And the proof is that the two schemes represent canonically isomorph isomorphic functors, the isomorphism being given by star. Okay, now a simple observation. Notice that if you have a Artinian quotient A, then the associated, if the associated graded is Gorenstein, then A is as well. And the reason is simple enough. We take an element, well, we have to work locally on K. If we take an element that generates, no, sorry, whose initial form generates, then the element will generate as well. So that's a simple general lemma. You can find it in the T and McDonald's. But, uh, here, <clears throat> though, the converse doesn't hold. Here's the standard example of a Gorenstein quotient whose associated graded algebra is not Gorenstein. So you just take for Q um, x1 to the minus three plus x2 to the minus two and it's dual. And it's easy to see that the associated graded well, it's generated by the initial form plus uh, x2 minus one, if we take q and multiply it by x2, we kill the first term and turn the x2 to the minus two to x2 to the minus one. So this associated graded does not have a single generator and so it's not Gorenstein. What about, uh, yeah compressed algebras. So let's consider filtered quotients of Sockle degree fixed S. Then we say, this is Tony's definition, that A is compressed if the rank of A is maximal among all such quotients. 
Now it's easy to see that they exist if we take an arbitrary algebra A, look at its dual, then the ranks are, are the same, but A stars is contained in this um, A module, R module, uh, F inverse R dagger, which has finite rank. Of course, we could bound the, the rank without going to the dual, but the reason for doing so is that it suggests a better bound. Yeah, so as long as they all have bounded rank, then there's there's some of maximal rank. Okay, there's a better bound. For convenience, let A be the, this uh, number, the largest integer in S over two plus one. And let's say that A star is generated by RQ. So it's a Gorenstein um, algebra. And, well, we argue locally. Then we can um, look at the multiplication now. Uh, it's best to mod out by the eighth term of the filtration on, on both sides. Then the rank of A uh, is the sum of two pieces. It's the rank of the source plus the rank of, um, well, the target is a submodule. And, and so that's the sum of these two. Um, binomial uh, sums of binomial coefficients. Of course, if we have an algebra whose rank meets this better bound, then it's compressed. All other algebras are going to have smaller rank. But the remarkable thing is that the converse holds, at least over a field. So I call this effect because it's due to Tony Garbino, not, not to Jan and myself. Um, well, you, you essentially generalize the example to get an A with the, the maximal rank. So Tony worked it out uh, for an infinite field and that's, Boris um, worked it out for any K. Now, another remarkable fact that Tony proved is that over a field, a module is compressed if and only if its associated graded module is compressed. And the real content here is that um, the associated graded is art, art uh, is Gorenstein as well, because of course the two modules have the same, the two algebras have the same length. What's more, if a star is um, is cyclic, then the cyclic generator has an initial term which generates the associated gradient. That's really the way to look at it. So um, if we have a module of rank B, so a compressed module, and we look at its dual and suppose it's cyclic, then the eighth grade, then in order to reach the bound, we have to have the tail end um, this, of the filtration of A equal to that of the graded dual. 
and the map mu has to be an isomorphism of modules because we have a surjective map uh, onto um, a star since the source and target have the same we have a subjective map and the source and target have the same rank so it has to be an isomorphism at least of filtered modules uh and i sorry an isomorphism of modules but now if you look a little more carefully at it you can see that the isomorphism actually preserves the filtration or well, that's the finesse it, it's not very hard if you see what to do with the intelligent proof and uh, since the associated grade of, of mu is an isomorphism well the associated grade is generated by the um, term of, of q Now, uh, if we look at um, the projective space on the um, polynomials of degree S, they will generate, uh, so they will parameterize all the art and rings. Now, I use growth and uh, point of view, so uh, these are one dimensional quotients. If you dualize and you get the sub modules and the, the quotients are locally free so we're looking at locally free sub modules of the graded dual and now we can stratify this set uh, we had these um the loci of graded homogeneous um, submodules uh, with, um, hmm. do I want submodules or quotients? Quotients, I guess. Um, well, some of them are Gorenstein. They're not all Gorenstein. So we just want the Gorenstein ones here. Of course, every scheme point lies in one of these um, loci. So we get a stratification. Okay. So here's a, a result. If you set H uh, equal to the this um, function, then the corresponding locus is a dense open subscheme of the projective space. Moreover, for any um, ground ring K and any extension capital K of it, the capital K points well, they represent compressed course Gorenstein homogeneous quotients of um, the polynomial ring with coefficients in capital K. Yes? Is there a question? And of course, the rank is equal to B. Now, the reason for this is that forming the projective space and forming these loci, these sub loci, can use with base change uh, any representable functor will commute with base change. So we pass to the fibers where we have a base field, then the projective space is irreducible. So its generic point is going to lie in one of the strata. And that strata will have in its closure all the others. 
but the rank is upper uh, semi continuous. So this locus that contains uh, the generic point is going to have the Hilbert function, which is uh, termwise uh, greater than all the other Hilbert functions that appear. But um, we took uh, sharp to be the maximal Hilbert function. So it has to be equal to H diamond. But now we can pass to any base K and see that all the uh, algebras uh, which are so given by K capital K points, quotients of the polynomial ring with coefficients in capital K, they're all compressed um, because they have the termwise maximal Hilbert function. And of course, its rank is the, the sum of the terms of the Hilbert function, which is um, beta. Finally, you have to check that uh, this locus is an open subscheme. Um, it's uh, it's supported on an open subset just because it's a subscheme containing the generic point of each fiber, but it's actually an open subscheme and that takes a little argument, not very much. Okay. So, so far, yeah, we've worked with the homogeneous low side, um, homogeneous algebras and modules and the low side of them. But now let's look at the uh, arbitrary modules, arbitrary code quotients that are just filtered. So within the, the locus of filtered modules with Hilbert function H sharp, we can take the open subscheme of Gorenstein quotients and look at the retraction um, from it to the homogeneous ones, past the associated graded. And it's possible to, to analyze the fibers. Um, given um, reciprocal uh, a monomial of degree minus s in the graded dual and two modules in the filtered um, submodule of, of the, the term one minus s of, of the dual. You can study when two are the same. This Tony did and, and found that the fiber spaces are all affines. The fibers are all affine spaces of this dimension. And, and his proof just carries over pretty much. Okay, back to the example at the beginning. Um, then the uh, function, the Hilbert function H sharp is um, one R R one. Now, We've been looking at modules that are concentrated at one point, the origin, but we can translate them over all of AR and then get the full locus gamma. So the dimension of gamma is the dimension of those concentrated at the origin 
plus r for the translation. So the dimension of gamma is the dimension of the um, homogeneous modules and the, or algebras and the uh, dimension of the fiber plus r. And if you work that out, you get the number um, mentioned at the beginning. Well, what sort of generalizations have we worked on? Well, first of all, um, up to now, the, the variables have been given weight one, the standard weighting. But much of what I've explained works in the um, weighted case where the variables have higher degree. And in fact, you can replace the polynomial ring by a more general graded algebra and look at quotients of that. But for that matter, why not look at quotients of a fixed graded R module? Why do they have to be algebras? Okay, so we've been looking at Gorenstein um, algebras, but there's a, another sort that generalizes it and has been studied quite a bit. These are the level algebras. So instead of having uh, one minimal generator, instead of being cyclic, um, you could take T minimal generators of the same um, degree. And then instead of using the projective space, you just use the Grassmannian and um, the same sort of uh, flattening stratification. We could go one step further and allow our generators to have different degrees that we bunch them up according to degree. And then we get something called the Sockle type, which is a function. Uh, it's the Hilbert function of the uh, tensor product with the ground ring. And so by Nakayama's lemma, we're looking at um, minimal generators. So um, the T star, that's the dual function, is the generator type of A star. Uh, so multi-level itself, uh, yeah, one in which we have several levels, one built on the, on what came before, and we do recursion on the the diameter of the, the distance between the two ex non-zero extremes. Um, and the idea is pretty straightforward. Now, it's common to call this the Sockle type. And so what is the Sockle? Why, why is this called the Sockle type? Well, the Sockle, which is considered often, is, is just the uh, set of homomorphisms from K into A. Well, this is a submodule of A, but you can deal with it because it's the dual of the generator module, A star R K. So this is another one of Tony's discoveries, which is why I call it a fact. From our point of view, you can look at it this way. First of all, the homomorphisms uh, from K into A are by duality, by, by star duality. 
um, just, well, we have an anti-isomorphism with categories. So we have uh, the homomorphisms from A star to K star. And now if we use adjoint associativity, we see that uh, we get the dual of um, the generating margin. But otherwise, the cycle itself doesn't play much of a role. What's important is this generator margin, at least important for this theory. So thank you all for your attention. Okay, thank you, Steve. All right, so questions. Don't forget to unmute your microphone. So Steve, do you look at this, you know, Royce Kjellnes was, was, you know, looking at the functors and, and Luxoff were looking at the functors of finite quotients of, of, or saying that you take a local ring and look at the finite quotients and find all sorts of strange behavior. Do you, have you looked at that? At, at Laxov's work? Uh, Royce Knellness, uh and I think he did one paper with Laxov, yeah. Uh, I just found some very, guess, that they would be very careful in talking about finite quotients of, of a local algebra and the Hilbert scheme. Well, of course, yeah, I do, yeah, I'm gonna try and... Well, um, yeah, we're, of course we're careful, <laughs> uh, but um, please be good enough to send Jan and me the, uh, the references and we'll, we'll look into it. Uh, I don't recognize the, the work offhand. Um, yeah, in case people are wondering why I'm wearing this hat, it's because it's my <laughs> real hat. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> you have real on your head. <laughs> yes. That's, that's nice. So, okay. So um, yeah, so my sweater is a Norwegian sweater. It's all of Norway and the classic design. Yeah. In honor of Jan's country. And you are in the US, I assume. What's that? You are in the US. I'm in the US, yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> That's the mixture. Yeah. All right. Any more questions? So okay. uh, Steve. Yeah, everyone should feel free to to write to me and Jan with um with questions if, if any come up. And yeah. the, the handout for my talk is uh, on the website apparently. So you can um, download a copy if you'd like and, and, and uh, ask us about it. Uh, right. Steve, you considered the, the Hubert scheme of the affine space, right? Yeah. Can we consider projective uh, things as well, uh, rational, or how, how is that? Oh, <laughs> well, yeah. We don't know about all of them, but the uh, um, the compressed ones are are an open subscheme of the uh, of the projective space when they're, they're homogeneous, mm -hmm. and, and then uh, when they're not homogeneous, there's some question really. So. You have a natural map, uh, the retraction to the homogeneous ones, and and the fibers are apparently affine spaces. Mm -hmm. But whether there's a locally trivial structure in the Zariski topology, or you have to go to some Atal topology, or, or what, I'm not really sure about that. 
I mean, I know if you go to uh, really tell topology, then you'll have a product structure, but it, it, it's not clear that it's, uh, to me anyway, that it's a product and there's a risky topology. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. And these compressed algebras, uh, they always have uh, this uh, D equals to 2R plus 2, right? Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, okay, uh, that's confusing. No, um, that was just the key example of historically. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh -huh. But uh, no, we, we work with art and algebras of uh, arbitrary art and algebras and more generally these multi-level algebras. Right, right. So it's it's uh, this here and uh, okay, okay. Uh, now I see the Hilbert, uh, okay, the Hilbert function would be very different, okay. Right, right. Okay. I might say that uh, the notion of multi-level algebras is something new because over a field, uh, every algebra is multi-level. But what's special uh, for us is the imposition of flatness, of local freeness of, of the associated graded, well, uh, of the algebra itself, but more strongly of the associated graded. And uh, you need that, um, that flatness to get good families and to represent the function. Okay, so if uh, there are no more questions, uh, uh, I'll, I'll try. Yes. Um, right, go ahead. Uh, just, just say hello to, to Steve uh, to begin with. I, I, I recall uh, a lecture by Skilnes where he had some quite unexpected uh, results on non closed points. In, uh, in one of these hills. I wonder if you could add anything to that? Uh, Do you remember? No. Uh, I don't think that our work has much overlap with, with his. Uh, maybe Jan knows better. That was the question I asked also. You asked as well? Yeah. Uh, I, I think uh, Roy's work, Skelness's work goes off in a different direction. Um, it's not that related to what we're doing. But maybe I'm missing something. Okay, if uh, there are no more questions now, uh, let's uh, thank Steve again. And uh, thank you all for attending. I'm uh, uh, stopping the record.